Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that was good. Great jacket too there. Is that your mama? That's my mother, yeah. Oh, I guess I gotta, I gotta get a... She was 18. Wow. In that picture, that was a... She, she was born in Iowa. Yeah. Now, I, actually, that's kind of where I wanted to wanted to start talking to you. was because um, Pete Kuykendall had told me about her being, being so beautiful. He really liked her. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he was saying that... Um, that she was uh, part Blackfoot, maybe Blackfoot, and then so was she adopted or was she was, and, and so but was she also native Blackfoot? Like her, her father was more. He had more. He had I don't know how much he had. Uh huh. But uh, she was part Indian. She had black blue black hair when she was a young woman. You know. So her biological father was black. Was Indian. Yeah. Okay. The man that adopted her was an Episcopal preacher. Gotcha. Wow. So, because one of the things that I was just always wondering about was, uh, you know, because your dad had a like, cool connection to like the native like tones and all that, like the, the ancient tones, and all that. And I just was wondering if some of well, that was. I think over. a lot of that came from his uncle Penn and, okay. his, and his mother. She played fiddle too. Yeah. My father liked the old stout sounds that he he really studied his uncle. Yeah. And he uh, he learned those sounds those tune so good that's that was the foundation of his bluegrass music yeah and uh yeah. It's, well, it's interesting you know absolutely oh my gosh so deep what was your mama like oh she was funny she was good she was great <laughs> <laughs> she was uh she was just a special person she was real honest mm -hmm. she'd tell you exactly like it is uh -huh. and, uh, she she kept me and my sister in line melissa monroe was my sister mm -hmm. and she just uh, and my dad was gone so much see i don't want to get to see him maybe on saturday Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, because he'd come in and do the Opry, you know. Mm -hmm. But she was she was strong. She, she made us stay in line, you know. Yeah. Were you born in Carolina? Or... No, my sister was. I was born here in Nashville. Okay. So you're my Nashville si all the way. My sister was born in Charlotte. Gotcha. That's where I live now. Yeah. And, so, yeah. Already, yeah. She was yeah. born in 36. I was born here in Nashville in 41. Okay. Yeah. What was y'all's relationship like? Y'all get along pretty good growing up? Oh, we, we, she, when I first came into the world... I think she wasn't happy with it because uh -huh. she'd been there five and a half years uh -huh. before me. Star of the show, right? And she was, uh, uh, she just, uh, she was loved me later on, but I mean, she, she tried to kill me when I was young. I think, oh, yes. <laughs> not uh -huh. literally, but I mean, uh -huh. and, uh, that, that scar right there on my forehead, right there, she put there, oh, and uh, in the middle of my eyes, and and uh, she, I would do anything. She pretty much said, she said, uh, she said, Jim, stand in front of this cabinet. I said, why? She said, well, just, I just do it. Uh -huh. So I did. She hit, hit, put my head against that cabinet, and hit me in the back of the head. And what? It, and it cut that. Oh my gosh. And my mother wore her butt out. That's so mean. Oh my gosh. But I mean, she just done things to me like it sometimes. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. Some girls could be mean, man. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but uh, we, got, we got it together later on, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I had a funny uh, kind of a childhood, man. I mean, there was so much. We had a 44 acre farm I was raised on, you know. And uh, we, uh, my dad had horses, had a lot of horses. Mm -hmm. Game chickens and dog. he had eighteen twenty foxhounds and wow. they had their own pen like a half acre pen, a yard pen. That's a lot of dogs, yeah. So I learned how to water stuff early on in my life. I was carrying buckets of water everywhere. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Water the chickens, the dogs, the horses, whatever. Uh -huh. you know. A lot of work. So I was a farm boy between six and seven on up till I was eighteen. Uh huh. And uh, then my folks divorced and I got me to do other jobs. I worked at Sunbeam Bakery loading bread trucks at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Worked hanging sheet rock for a, a season, you know. Yeah. Then one day, when I was about 21, my dad called me uh -huh. and said, uh, "Can you? I need to go. I gotta play Georgia. Mm -hmm. Can you go?" I said, "I said I can go, but I can't play. Any. I don't know. I never played music." He said, wow. well, "Don't worry about that." He said, "Just stand behind me. Keep time with your right hand on the bass." Wow. That was my introduction into playing. I would have been so nervous. Oh, tell me about it, man. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I pulled that hat down far as over my face I could get it. <laughs> we was on a big, uh, big truck bed out doing a grand opening in Atlanta for a big shop, and there was uh -huh. I don't know how many people was there. I, looking back at it, looking back at it, probably a thousand or so. Uh -huh. But I just didn't. I when my dad moved to play like a mandolin break, I'd move with him because I didn't want nobody to see me, man. Uh -huh. And uh, then he'd go move back, and then I'd, I'd come back with him too. So. Uh huh. <laughs> just keeping time with the right hand. I did that, yeah. So that's the most important thing with the right. That's what I was doing. I, I just and I kept it muffled. I learned. I learned quickly. Just muffle my sound, you know. Uh huh. And uh, but uh, he after that show was over, he said, "Are we feminine? I mean, are you doing anything on this?" Uh -huh. This is going okay. 
I, I may be saying some things I'm interested in say here. I don't know. I can always edit it out if you don't want to. But he, he, uh, he said, uh, if you want to learn this now and become a, a bluegrass boy, I said, uh, you can start studying it. You know? mm -hmm. And so I did. I mean, I thought, well, I, I was, I'd been doing manual labor for a pretty good while, and I thought, mm -hmm. why not try to be, and I, I could go on the road with my dad's son. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get to do that when I was yeah. a little too much, you know. Yeah. But he, he uh, I got the records out and I started learning what chord changes were, you know, uh -huh. understanding how they went. On the bass. On the bass fiddle. Yeah, yeah. And I worked hard on it. I practiced all the time. Mm -hmm. When I was home, I'd play with the records. And, because he was on the road a lot, even then, say in the 60s, yeah. and he, uh, I didn't get much chance to rehearse. He never did rehearse his show ever, ever. Wow. We, we would do that on the show. Wow. You, you did your rehearsing really on the show. Jeepers. With the Grand Ole Opry. Fire. <laughs> or uh, wherever we played Carnegie Hall, we played all the places in the world, man, like yeah. great places, and some of the smallest places in the world. But uh -huh. back in those days, it was folk houses too. Yeah. Now. Did a lot of those things, and, but we, uh, I learned, and I became a good bass player. But I had to work hard to do it. Yeah. So when you when like your first gig, who was on guitar at that time? Well, let's see. Let's see. Uh, it wasn't Pete Rones, was it? No, he wasn't there then. Uh, was was Dell? No, he was. He's he was already gone. Uh, Who's after Dell? I think uh, Sandy Rothman came in for a while from California. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sandy might have been there, and then let's see. I'm not. I can't say exactly because I can't. Yeah, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't think Sandy was there yet because uh, it could have been Joe Stewart or somebody like that. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the standbys, and uh, yeah. I really don't remember. I was so scared. I, I didn't. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> did you? Did, was there much guidance from from your dad about like zero? You, zero, just like wow. You're on your own. Wow. So you just kind of had to. If you asked him a question, he'd tell you. Uh -huh. I mean, but he he don't he didn't sit and tutor anyone. Wow. No one ever. Yeah. Now, he helped Kenny Baker a lot with certain fiddle tunes. Uh -huh. If, if uh, he if he wanted to teach Kenny one of his new instrumentals, uh -huh. he would go through that with Kenny pretty much. Uh -huh. and, uh, but he he uh, now he would help me, you know if I. Uh, if I asked him certain things, he would tell me exactly what needed to be done, you know. But I knew I needed to practice. I knew uh -huh. I, I needed to learn. Well, he must have believed in you. Well, he, well, he, I think he had plans for me that I didn't know I, that he had. Yeah. Uh, because, see, looking back, I thought about that later. He knew that I was hearing his music all the oh, time. Yeah. I was a little boy. Yeah, yeah. And I was taking it in, not realizing that I was taking it in. Totally. And it didn't take me all that long to start learning uh, chord changes and... Mm -hmm. And uh, certain things, and then all of a sudden, he wants me to start singing in trios. Yeah. Singing lead. I never had yeah. sung before. Wow. And uh, he, uh, oh, I did around the house with my sister, just cutting up and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But then he he uh, wanted me to do some duets with him, like yeah. Blue Moon Turns It Old Again. And we, oh, I love that. We did that and finally recorded that together. You know? Yeah. And he uh, he would, got, he told me, he said, Pitch your song where it fits your voice. He said, mm -hmm. don't sing too high above where you can handle it. Yeah. He said that to keep it at the range you can handle. Yeah. And he said, always follow your melodies. Yeah. So that's what I did. You're one of my favorite singers in Blue Well, Paris. I appreciate it. And, yeah. And, and then later on, we cut other stuff like Haven't Seen Mary in Years and Tall Pines and stuff like that. How did how did I Haven't Seen Mary in Years come to y'all? Well, Damon Black was our friend. He, he was from he Missouri. Wrote he wrote that. Okay, yeah. And he, uh, he and I became good friends. He worked for Mel Tillis at Cedarwood. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Mel Tillis' company for a pretty good while. Mm -hmm. Not Cedarwood, another name. And, uh, well, I, uh, and then he uh, started writing these songs. And he said, uh, James, I got a song I want you to hear. And uh, Porter Wagner had cut it. Mm -hmm. And was going to put it on an album. And Tillis had cut it. And uh, so I was in, I think they might have cut it after me, or but I can't remember now, but I liked it. Mm -hmm. I liked the song, so I took it to my father, and we started going over it. You took it to him? Yeah, cool. And then we then we uh, got it together. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he, he then he brought me Tall Pines, and I, oh, I liked yeah. that. So I, naturally, I'd carry it to my daddy, so we'd, yeah. we'd work on them together. And yeah. That's how those things came about, you know? Yeah. So, so I played some music with my dad, too. And it's just so special. It's not always the easiest thing. Um, what were some of the the challenges that you like got, that you got through? Like, was there ever any like moments where that were kind of tough that you had to like communicate? It was just awkward and like about the music or anything being in the band. Well, 
when you do stuff like rawhide uh-huh. and you and you got a and Roanoke, yeah. you got to bring it. Yeah, yeah. And you have to. Uh, I learned real fast that you know you have to study. You have to hold that t- time in your head. Yeah. You can't let it nothing take it away from you. Right. So I learned that early on to uh, mm-hmm. not early on, but I learned it pretty pretty soon that mm-hmm. uh, you got to hold that bass has to hold that timing. Yeah. It's got to be there. Yeah. But I, what I learned about my father's music so much was his drive. Yeah. And I took, I've, I've kept that in my head, and I, I yeah. really instilled that in myself to play that because I love that. Yeah, yeah. When I left his band and took my own group, I, I instilled in them. I want that drive time, man, that my yeah. that I learned from my father. I said, and a lot of them thought playing fast was it, and I, I said right. no. I said that's, I said you got to play on the edge, yeah. top of the beat. Yeah. Playing real fast is not it. Right. But yeah, I had yeah. a hard time explaining that to some people. That's and tricky. Yeah, some people think that drive. Just playing fast is drive, but it's not. It's yeah. not. Yeah. Do you remember going to England? I do, man. That, that was a great trip. And uh, uh, we played, uh, let's see, London and uh, uh, close to us. I went to Soho. And uh, uh-huh. uh, I'm trying to think of a place we're close to Liverpool. We played uh-huh. there. And, uh, it was just a great, beautiful country. Yeah. Everything's so green when you get there. Just mm-hmm. beautiful, beautiful country. And uh, we rode, uh, rode around an old bus there that uh, wasn't the best in shape in the world, but we made our shows, you know. Uh-huh, yeah. So what was the transition like going from And Pace? we played the Royal Albert Hall in London. Ah, that's a big one. Yeah. Any, any particular nights you really enjoyed out there? Different shows? Oh, I loved all those tourists and we played England with then we go to we played Germany and played Italy oh wow so we had a, a big tour going on there and uh, yeah. Bill Clifton was living over there at the time and oh. we got to visit with him stay with him some yeah. and he helped us in that country a little bit to, yeah. to tutor us a little bit where to go to and what not what yeah, to do yeah it's good to have a friend overseas. yeah yeah really yeah. and he uh I won't forget that so that was good yeah, yeah. so what was the, the transition like going from bass to I guess Pete Rowan left and then, and then you went right into guitar? No, right? no, let's see. Uh, Pete, no. There was Roland after Pete. Yeah, Roland came after Pete Rowan. Yeah. And, uh, and let's see, uh, and then Bur- then uh, Green left, the fiddle player. Uh-huh. And then Burlon came in. Oh, wow, yeah. So we, it was me and and Vic Jordan. So it was, yeah. it was uh, Byron, me, and Vic, and Roland. Mm-hmm. And we... We had good times together, and then uh, after a certain length of time, then Roland and Vic left to go with Flat. That's when I came in on the. Doug Green really came in ahead of me, maybe two weeks. Gotcha. But he went he went back to school at Ann Arbor, Michigan. So mm-hmm. then my father said, "You think you might can handle a guitar job?" I said, "I I can try it." Yeah. And that was a tough task, man, because it says uh-huh. I hadn't hadn't spent any time on the guitar hardly at all. Uh-huh. And he. Uh, I knew the songs right. that we do, that we did. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's a different story, but that guitar, boy, you had to bring it. And, and yeah. uh, you got your runs to put in after Muse Skinner or after Uncle Penn. And, right, right. And uh, those those can be done, but I, I didn't know this, the gauge pick to use when I started. Oh. I used like a medium gauge. I thought maybe that's pretty good. And, right, right. And I used medium gauge strength, so when you blend those two things together, you, you can't make anything solid count. It just... You, uh. you, Skip a, you slide over things, and gotcha. yeah, yeah. so I had learned to use heavy gauge uh-huh. and heavy gauge strings. Uh-huh. And once I did that, then I started nailing down my G run, yeah. pretty good. Yeah, but I missed it for a while because I didn't. I was going through that learning, inexperienced type of thing with it. You know, yeah. I had a guy ask me one day. He said he was interviewing us, us with the IBMA. Uh-huh. They was doing an interview with me and Vic and Roland, and he said, uh, "said James, I remember when you." Played the guitar, you missed you missed those runs quite a bit, and your father would look over with, with you with anxiety. I said, well, he, I said you got that wrong on him. I said he never looked up me with anxiety. I said he, he, uh, he knew that if you missed it, you need to practice more. Right. And he didn't. Uh, if he, he looked over that way because he expected you to do the run. That's that's the only reason right. he looked over that way. Yeah, yeah. So I was trying to explain that to that guy. Uh-huh. That's after just thirty years after I after he heard me make a mistake. Man. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this yeah. man still remembers the mistake I made. <laughs> 30 years prior, you know? right. right. 
And I said, well, I was just inexperienced. I said, I had to have to learn, you know. I said, yeah. uh, I did learn. I said, then I could hit the two runs. Yeah. Just said, That's down in the deep end. I said that uh, I just didn't know how to do it at the time, but uh-huh. I'd been five years on the base fiddle, and that's, that's all I thought about. Yeah. Y'all did quite a bit of recording in that time. Right? We, we did. I, I cut almost probably over 100 sides with my father. Wow. During my time with him. Yeah, and the whole father and son album, too. We did, and I come back after I got on my own. Still, He and I still did some things together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I was on, uh, after I left, I came back and we did uh, the Hall of Fame album. Mm-hmm. I think we did, uh, I think I was on Jerusalem Bridge, that stuff with him. You know? mm-hmm. Do you have any favorites from the recordings? Uh, I, just so many good things. I, I, I love Jerusalem Ridge. I think that's a masterpiece. Oh, yeah. I, I think it. Uh, back when I was with him, I played the bass on the Gold Rush and mm-hmm. Virginia Darling and Burline was playing the fiddle in those times, you know. Yeah. And uh, speaking of Burline, I think he's probably the best there was on, on Sally Good. I don't think nobody can touch him on so that. So good. Yeah, that's perfect recording. Just, and uh, Chubby Wise, I think he's the best on, on Footprints and Snow with the foot, my little blues oh, yeah. he puts in there. Oh, yeah. I think Baker's the best on Muse Scanner. Yes, I mean, yes, I got yes, my yeah. ideas on who I think yeah. is the best on certain certain tunes, you know. Yeah. But it was fun playing with all those guys. You know, they're all great players. And, yeah. But when I, when I got back to the opera, I watched these players, see, like Buddy, uh, I mean, like uh, Joe Zinkis, great bass player. Yeah. I'd watch him. I'd watch uh, uh, these bass and I'd learn. Mm-hmm. And I'd pick it up, and I'd adapt to that. I'd pick it up and use it in my own music. You know? Yeah, different note note paths or. Whatever. And the way they, the way they, note out and the way they pick. You know? Yeah, yeah. I don't like slap bass. I like to pull uh-huh. the bass. You know? Yeah. So I'm just guessing that, that you know, after a while playing the guitar, you, you started to feel like you wanted to go out on your own. Well, what happened? I was with my dad. We was playing Myrtle Beach, a big festival down there. Yeah. And Roy Martin, who ran that festival. Said uh, said James, I've got a a man that, did, that a band that couldn't show up. Could you take the Bluegrass Boys and do thirty minutes for me? Yeah. So I went and asked my father. He said, he said, now if you do it, I'll pay you three hundred dollars. Right See, I was making fifty a day. So I mean, right. I, I thought the money was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, I asked my dad. I said, can I? Is that okay if I do? He said, yeah, you can do it. Nice. So I did that, and that's got me thinking. Mm-hmm. After that, I got a real good hand. After we got, I after we did our thirty minutes, and I was scared now, but I because I hadn't done any MC work at that point, mm-hmm. you know. But we got through it, and and uh, I thought, well, maybe I can do, go on my own. So about I don't know, maybe a month later, I told my father, I said, I'd like to try to go out on my own. Wow. I know he hated to hear that because mm-hmm. I'd been with him seven years, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh, but he, uh, I did it. And when I did leave him, I went to a friend of mine in Nashville named Shorty Lavender. He was had a book. Oh, yeah, I know his son. He, he was booking big acts at that time. And he was a friend of mine, uh-huh. a country player. Yeah. But I asked him, I said, Shorty, I'm getting ready to go on my own. You think I could get booked mm-hmm. on other shows and, and to get started on my own? He said, well, yeah. Uh, he called me James. He said, I think you can. But he said, I think the best thing I could tell you to do, though, is get you off office are you a girl and get your phones in. I said, mm-hmm. she can spend eight hours a, a day on you where I can only spend maybe 30 minutes. Right. I've got so many other acts. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I started Monroe Talent Agency. Oh, yeah, yeah. I found an office out on 16th Avenue. Mm-hmm. The day I left this office now, I saw this sign that says for rent. Mm-hmm. So I went in, it was uh, Goldmont Records, and this lady there was Betty McIntyre, who later became one of our secretaries for 20 years mm-hmm. at Monroe Enterprise. Mm-hmm. But she showed me the upstairs, it was two offices, and it was kind of rough looking, but I took them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I got my phone set up, I put air, little windy air units in there. Right. Got the desk and the filing caps and that stuff and hired me a girl. Uh-huh. And I told my father what I'd done. Mm-hmm. He said, well, I said, well, you want to book us now, you can take us too, you know? And, yeah. and uh, I thought, well, man, if I, it's, it's pretty heavy to have Bill Monroe in my booking agency, you right, know? Right, right, yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah. uh, and then when he came in, then Clyde Moody heard about it. He said, uh, uh-huh. Jim, can you book? I said, yeah, yeah. So he came in. Then the Sullivan family came in from wow. Alabama. Yeah. And then a group called the Bluegrass Alliance that was in Louisville. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we, they wanted me to book them. So I took them in. Yeah. And we had Bill Monroe, James Monroe, Clyde Moody, the Sullivan family, Wilma Stoney Cooper. Wow. And uh, Bobby Smith and the boys from Shiloh. Wow. And Jimmy Skinner. Uh-huh. So uh, and uh, we had a pretty good a thing roster. within a year. Yeah, yeah, wow. 
Uh, but it got I, I started it to book me. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I had to find another agent, man. I couldn't do everything. So, oh, wow. I mean, so I found uh, Chuck Campbell out of Kentucky. He came down and he started booking, uh-huh. too, you know. Uh-huh. But that's where Monroe Talent Agency started from. Dig it. It was me trying to get started in the music business. Yeah. So, so when you first started leading your band, what was that like? Was it challenging? Did you it was. I was. I would. I would well, when I first went on my own, I was, I'd break out in the house. Oh, wow. I didn't tell any, any of my boys about it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But uh, finally, it got so bad, I told I found some stuff on me, and I had Bernie and Derek, who was playing fiddle for me. I said, uh-huh. Bernie, could you put some on my shoulders? And he said, uh-huh. he, he would do that. Uh-huh. I said, I don't know what's causing it. I didn't tell him I was scared about traveling on the road. Right. Yeah. But he, he did that, and it got rid of that stuff pretty good. But uh, see, here's uh, the first date I had was Bean Blossom, uh-huh. and it's 5,000 people in there. <sighs> And I, I was used to playing it with my father, with the bluegrass boys. Right. And I, when I was young, I talked so fast nobody understood me. <laughs> so I knew I had to break my sentences up. Ah, yeah. So I would say it's good to be here with you today. Here at Bean Boss. Oh, I learned how to break myself down. Gotcha. T- to not talk so fast nobody would understand me. Interesting. Yeah. So I learned that, and I started doing so working very, on that. From the very first gig, you were consciously like thinking about how to deliver. To I was. Job. Yeah. I was trying to think how to That's do that. Interesting. And I, I, I had my music down good enough, and my songs I knew well enough, and my band was coming on pretty good. Yeah. But the very first day I had there, my band's player couldn't make it. Oh, sucks. So I asked uh, Eddie Adcock if he'd hit me on my first show, and he said, yeah. Uh-huh. So Eddie came out and helped me, and I asked Don Reno, I asked, he hit me on my second show. Nice. You can't find two better band mm-hmm. players to help me. <laughs> so I mean, I appreciated those guys helping me when I started there, but the next trip, trip I was going to, I had to go to Disney, Oklahoma, and I was on a show there with Lester Flatt and his uh, National Crash was there, and the Osmond Brothers, mm-hmm. and me. Mm-hmm. And so I was, I was concerned naturally about that. But when I got on the stage there, I noticed out to the right side of the stage there was a big fence out there, and it went down the audience lot here, and the stage went down on the side where there wasn't any people at. But I saw Lester and Flatt and Sonny Osmond down there watching me. Uh-huh. They walked down about uh-huh. 50 feet and uh-huh. just stood there and watched me. Uh-huh. And uh, that put more pressure on me. I'd say. Yeah, but I yeah. mean, those type of things I dealt with and and I got through it. But then I went to I played Livonia, Georgia. You might have you might have heard of yeah, that. My parents met there actually. Yeah. And uh, we, I was on the stage down there. Uh, Charlie Waller came up there, walked through the whole crowd and sat on the front row just watched me. Mostly about how I was going to handle it. Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, it's those kind of pressure zones, man, I had to deal with and had to learn how to deal with them. Yeah, yeah. And then I played Merkin Beach again and on the wing of the end, inside of the stage where nobody could see him. There's a big full house audience out there now. Uh-huh. And that auditorium was Bill Monroe and Jimmy Martin. Ooh. They was watching me. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I was under the gun, buddy, I, yeah. when I started out on my own. Yeah. A lot more than people think. Uh, I, just because I'm a Monroe don't mean I could automatically get them to do things like my father, I couldn't do that. Sure. I had to do it my style, and I yeah. picked out songs that I could handle like ballads. I like ballads. Yeah. And I like this kind of uh, tempo songs like I Wash My Hand in Muddy Water. I, I like yeah. those kind of beats, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I did those things, and I wasn't copying my father. I was just doing my style my way. You know? Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how I got started in the business. Yeah. What were what were some of your your favorite moments from your your time your all through the years from leaving the band? Well, I love the fact when back when Carlton Haney had his shows in in Berryville and Re, in Reedsville, yeah. uh, I liked the fact he he would let you he had jam sessions that he wanted done. Yeah, where my father would sing with everybody, and yeah. and I'd I'd get to come up on stage. I mean, Reno might be ahead of me, or right. and uh, the, Bobby Osborne may, but then I'd get to sing with my father. I thought that was really good because yeah. I had been a bluegrass boy, you know, for yeah. seven years. So that was an important time in my life. I thought you know. Mm-hmm. Did you and your dad stay close? Like, oh, yeah, we always were. There wasn't a day I didn't think about him or he didn't think about me. Yeah. When, we had, when I kept the offices all those years, Betty said, uh, your father asked about you, uh, you know, how you doing? And I said, no, I'm doing all right. And, I said, yeah. and I'd ask about him, you know, because mm-hmm. I might be in a, another date where he's not at or he might be in one where I'm not. And Right. So, but we'd still inquire about each other, you know. Yeah. Do you like Thanksgiving, Christmas together? Oh, yeah, we did all that, too. Uh-huh. Yeah, he he and I had a lot of we had uh, Monroe Bluegrass music uh, 
a club together. Oh, right. uh, Monroe Matter. I was on mine. I had that by myself. But yeah. he uh, he and I had some business together. Mm -hmm. And I built the Bill Monroe Booker's Hall of Fame and Museum. I really worked hard on that to get that done on yeah. Music Valley. Yeah. And but he and I owned that together. But he it was his tribute to my father, you know. Yeah. And to other bluegrass musicians. Yeah. How would you say that um, that like you and, and your dad are like the same and like how different, like personality wise? Well, I have the drive my father had. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he was. We both were ambitious people. Yeah. He and I think that came from my grandfather. I understood mm -hmm. that he. I never got to see my grandfather or my grandmother. They died way before I was born. Mm -hmm. But my grandfather had that 750 acre farm in Kentucky, Roseanne, yeah. and he had timber and he had coal. But then I heard later on that he started a general store up there mm. in Roseanne. And everybody charged much to him that he couldn't make it go because I mean, nobody had any money back yeah. in those days. You know? yeah, yeah. But he uh, he was a man who thought, evidently thought about doing various things. He had six boys and two girls. Yeah. And my dad was the youngest. And then my dad, my dad said one time he had he had been bossman. He had uh, when I was young and he he had started out. He had two minor league baseball teams. Oh, right. uh, one of the Bluegrass All Stars and one of the Bluegrass Special. Uh -huh. And uh, he he bought two city buses for him. One and wow. uh, and I'd get to go with him sometimes. And I was a bad boy. I, oh, that's fun. So I mean, I, when I was a kid, I loved baseball and I played yeah, yeah. little league when I was a boy. I pitched right. in little league. Uh -huh. But it, it's just. Uh, We've been busy people all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I first started on my own, I started uh, the booking agency. Mm -hmm. But then thereafter, I started the Bluegrass Star a little magazine. Mm -hmm. And Pete Cook and all that said, what axe are you grinding now? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm not got grinding the axe. I just wanted to start a magazine. Yeah, but yeah. It, he, uh, I ran that for a while. And, and, uh, and then I started the Cosby Festival. And, East Tennessee, mm -hmm. Newport Cosby. I had the first Tennessee Bluegrass Festival. Oh, wow. And I had people, you know, Lester came and played for me, my dad, naturally, and uh -huh. uh, Jim and Jesse, and uh, uh, great entertainers. Yeah. But uh, it's fun to get on your own yeah. and to do things, if, especially if you've got it in you to yeah. to want to do those things. Yeah. I've tried a little bit of leading my, my own band, and it's not easy. Not easy. What do you feel like were the, were the toughest things about it? Well, uh, it's trying to keep them into your music. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, one time, this story isn't long. Out. One time, I was with my dad, and we was coming into, uh, we was playing Asheville, I think, Carolina, mm -hmm. a big coliseum there, auditorium. Uh -huh. And I'd been in the bus, and I heard the radio going on, and I was hearing his music, and it was a uh, Glazer Brothers singing their one of their new hits, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I. I it was in my head, you know, how music sometimes will get into your so, mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, I came backstage and I was humming that tune or whistling it. My uh -huh. dad said, what are you doing? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, what's that tune? I said, well, that's, I thought I just heard it on the radio. He said, you don't need to be doing that. Oh, interesting. So I said, uh, it'll take your mind off of our music. Mm, gotcha. So about uh, four or five years later, I was in my camper. We started driving my boys back there, cop, trying to enter, uh, copy the Osborne Brothers Harmony. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I said, look, boys, I said, I'm paying you. I said, I need you to be doing Sweet Mary and the Miles in Between or Bonnie. Yeah. And I, I yeah. said, yeah, yeah. instead of the Osbergs, I said, so, right. so I, what my father said to me, I said to my boys the same thing. Yeah. And he was really right. Keep, keep your mind on your music. Uh -huh. That's the biggest thing you need to do with your band. Keep their mind on you, what you want done. Yeah. Yeah. I always found that it was really challenging trying to make the decision about trying to like get somebody to do something they can't do or try to just focus on what they can do. And I think I was always trying to get people to do stuff that they couldn't do, but might have been just be like, okay, well, you, you can play that way, so we'll just try to lean into that. Yeah. But the personal stuff is just always... Everybody's, people's got limitations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you have, to, you have to, once you start growing up, then you understand that they're, they can only do so much. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And you can expect more of them than what they can produce. So you got to learn how to go along with that and, yeah. and take the most you can from them and get them into your thinking. Yeah. Still, still again, yeah. try to draw them into where you're at. Yeah. What was like, um, do you like recording like with your band? Like, oh, I did. Well, I did, uh, uh, the best recording I did was when I would bring in other pros. I mean, I, I recorded quite a bit with the Midnight Brampers, but, mm -hmm. uh, it was good. It was when I could bring in Kenny Baker and Tommy Williams on Twin Fiddle Say. Yeah, yeah. 
and we did numbers like what about you that they backed me up on yeah they're so polished and, yeah. and so they go after the tone and the, and the right uh, breaks so good I don't have to worry about the band much there yeah I can concentrate on myself so, my singing yeah, yeah. I like that better yeah naturally it's yeah. easier for me that way but I've had some. I had some good players that uh, could get it pretty good when I, when they did. I cut in out in uh, Marietta, Georgia, one time at the Carl Queen when I was with uh, API Records, Adoram, mm -hmm. and and I had Jim Brock and uh, another fiddle player with me then, and I had uh, Gordon Reed on the bench. I think it was. Right. So, but we got through it good, and it just. Uh, but I knew that it wasn't what I had been used to, you know, but still, again, we got some pretty good music there. Yeah. And you, I got the most from them that I could get. And yeah. not, not, I ain't knocking them. I mean, they're, they're yeah. good, good players and good people, but uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it wasn't what I had been used to, mm -hmm. but uh, we got some good cut. And I, then I cut Smoky Mountain Memory, so we got a good oh, cut yeah. on that. And, uh, and I wrote a song, you talk, were talking about England a while ago, I wrote one called Destination Paradise while I was in England. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a gospel number. Nice. And it, and I did that there in Marietta too, you know. Mm -hmm. So I got some good recordings going on down there, and I was happy with that, you know. Yeah. How do you feel like you know you've seen so many decades of of bluegrass, you know, change, and what do you feel like you like about how it's changed, and what are you maybe not so fond of about how it's changing? Well, I was talking to Ronnie Reno one time about this. I said that, uh, in fact, we were talking about that very thing. Mm -hmm. I said, some of these young players today can really play. Mm -hmm. I said, I've heard some young girls and young boys that can play fiddle pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, I like what they're doing. I said, the groups that I'm hearing sometimes, I think they may be trying to be too perfect. Mm -hmm. I think they might be, they're losing some of their identity by trying to be too, uh, yeah. like a machine almost. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to lose that. You don't want to lose yeah. your personality. You know, you yeah. want to keep that and you want to, uh, sell yourself t so people know who you are yeah i mean you got to do that you can't if you have it too polished they, they're not going to recognize what you're doing i like how you, how you put that so I, I think you need to just keep your mind set on what you're after yeah and your music you know in your head yeah what about same question about bean blossom that's gone through its you know different phases well I would never have sold bean blossom when my dad died i would never have sold it except the government came after me for 300 and Seventy-five thousand dollars, not in heaven. So I, I, I luckily Dwight Dillman came along, mm -hmm. and I could sell it to him. So, yeah. I mean, I, if I hadn't have done it, I might have lost it. Yeah. And, and uh, or the government might have took it and sold it, and I might not have got much of anything out of it. You know. Yeah, yeah. But this way, when Dillman got it, I had some guidelines for him to go by. Mm -hmm. I don't think they've done it now. Whoever's got it, but mm -hmm. I wanted the Billman Museum to stay intact and, right. and, and to keep the festivals intact. Mm -hmm. And um, that lasted for a pretty good while, I think. But I, I don't know what's happening up here anymore. I hear some bad things on it now. I don't know. I think they still got the museum going. Have they? Yeah. I was up there maybe, I don't know, four or five years ago. I was just talking up there one time. But the museum was in pretty good shape. You see, that museum was when I moved from Nashville up there. That, oh, that was okay. the first. That was the first Bill Monroe Blue Guys Hall of Fame Museum. Gotcha. We just took it on up there. Gotcha. Well, I took it first to Twitty City, and then from Twitty City on up there to Beanwise. Where's Twitty City? It's Hendersonville. Okay, gotcha. It, uh, oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's it's where that uh, governor has got that thing down right across from Johnny Cash's old museum. Okay, you know? gotcha. that's where Twitty City used to be. Yeah, and so uh, you had done some recording last year, right? With some new songs that you've written. I did. How do you know that? Uh, Mike Bub. Told me. <laughs> he's the one who gave me your number, actually. Good yeah. friends of Bub. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. He. Uh, we did. I did some. Uh, some songs I wanted to try to get demoed out, you know, and I still, I still got to do some more. I hadn't gotten, yeah. I hadn't, I, there's two or three more that I need to get demoed, you know. Would you mind telling that story about the um, silver in your pocket? Let me get the birth tree, let you read it. Yeah, I love that. It's got good lyrics to it. It's got, uh, I don't want, I haven't, I mean, it's published in my company, but it's just a, uh, You can listen to this here if you want to hear this. I would like to. Uh, kids made fun of how he looked because his eyes were crossed. His father said, you can rise above what people say, let them pay their costs. It's all about the kindness you show and what you give away. He smiled and said, now take this coin, have fun today. Mm -hmm. 
He carried silver in his pocket just to give away, saved it for children he might see that day. Take this coin, he'd say with a smile. My dad did the same for me once in a while. Even though times have changed from how things were back then, uh, he had hoped the kids he met could feel the way he did. An offer of a coin, kindness with a smile, then move again on down the line to meet another child. He gave until he died to kids he never knew. It came back around. All those deeds have come true. The, the kids are grown up now. They come back to see the man. Place a coin on his grave with kindness from their hand. I love that. That's good. That's so sweet. So you can't go to his grave. You can't go to his grave right now, Chris, without seeing coins on it. Oh. Those kids. This is really a true thing. Yeah. They come right. back to put a quarter on his grave. That's so beautiful. And I, I've got pictures of him handing little kids a quarter. It mm -hmm. needs to be on this. Whoever cuts it, it needs to be on their album. I picture my dad yeah, giving a yeah. kid a quarter. You know? Yeah. That is wonderful. I think it's a good song. I, I think it it needs to have the right right uh, person to cut it. I'd love to hear it. But y'all got to cut it, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's not the best in the world, but I got one. Here, here's another song that I wrote about Uncle Penn's Cabin. Cool. Hilltop in Kentucky. Nice. I like your writing, man. Thank you. Yeah, maybe. Billy Strange got one of these. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you were asking me what I thought about Billy Strange. Uh, that was one of the questions that came in from the, from the internet. How, what do you think about Billy Strange? I think he's got a lot of talent. Yeah. I think he's got talent. I think he's got. Here's what I think about that whole outfit. Today, he has the opportunity through internet, mm -hmm. through all the powers that, that can be used today, yeah. way farther than we ever had. Yeah. Uh, He's got the opportunity, and he's, he's good, man. Yeah. He's got his, and they're so, they're smart people. I can see this that they yeah. are. Yeah. He's got a management group behind him, evidently, yeah. and a promotion yeah. publicity team. Yeah, that's really lifting him up. Totally. Uh, I expect the reason he came to Nashville was to be on the Opry. Mm. I think he he wants to be an Opry member, That'd be so cool. and I think he'll be that. Yeah, but I think that he, uh, I can recognize talent right away, but I recognize intelligence right away because. Yeah. And this business, you have to be real careful not to make mistakes yeah. and, and on everything that you do. Yeah. The camper you drive, the car that you get for, to carry your man in, you have to be careful to take care of that. Yeah. Uh, you have to learn how to really be responsible and, and uh, real careful on how to... That's that's one thing that I didn't tell you about a while ago when it comes mm. to running your business mm. and the music band business. You have mm. to study how to not to make mistakes. Yeah. I made so many mistakes, it pretty much drew me Well, out. you're going to make mistakes, but yeah. I'm saying you try not to. Yeah, yeah. That's the key. You try yeah. not to make them. Yeah. Everybody makes them. Sure. But, but uh, oh, the key is, and you, if you try not to, you won't make as many. That's mm -hmm. the key. That's what will help you see. Yeah. yeah. So I got I got one more question on my list, and then there's a whole bunch of more questions. <laughs> and we can do a few of those if you want. I don't to. mean to talk too much, man. No, I probably no, talk this is much. great. I'm loving getting to visit with you, getting to know you. A little bit. So the last question on my list was, when you get to see your dad again, what song you want to play first? For for him to me. For be all together. Oh, have seen Mary Nears, but Perfect. but but I want to hear him sing Blue Moon of Kentucky. Yeah. One more time. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. I love that. So all these questions here, I'll just kind of like check them out a little bit. Um, uh, came through this uh, this Facebook group. Where everybody's really interested in, in Monroe style metal. It's not all, it's, it's not about you know Monroe style metal necessarily, but it's uh, a lot about uh, you know you and your your career and and uh, and different things. So, all right. Oh, actually, this this question. Um, let's see. Oh, this is from my dad. He was asking uh, when you were playing bass, which guitar player of Bill's was the easiest to play along with. Uh, let's see. Pete was a good player. Mm -hmm. Pete Brown was. And uh, I would say probably Pete. Uh-huh. Well, Pete's playing. He, he was a... Uh, he studied the music, too, and that Pete did. And he uh, he tried to get, he tried to play as good as he could. I mean, he, he wanted to make it sound like it's supposed to. And he, he did that. I think he did. Yeah. 
Uh, Pete came from New England. He, he uh, so he had that style. That, you know, the, his voice wasn't like my father's when it came to be a southern singer. You know, but he, he learned how to blend. Yeah, with my dad. Yeah. Were y'all pretty good friends? Pretty good. Yeah, we uh, we run around a little bit together. But uh, uh, Lamar Greer was there in that group then, and, and uh, Richard Green, fiddle mm-hmm. player. And we had a pretty strong group. Oh gosh, yeah. I mean, a pretty pretty heavy duty group, and, and totally. uh, they was young too. And they uh, we was all about the same age there then. And he, uh, but we had fun, you know. And they, uh, I can't remember all the stuff that we. Well, we went to one place one time. We all got on horses. Oh, <laughs> it was wow. some kind of dude ranch or something. I don't, I don't right. remember the whole story, but it was funny because half of them couldn't ride nothing much. Uh-huh. But it was uh-huh. fun. we had fun that day, and, uh-huh. and we just uh, it was good times, man. I, and then then later on, Berline came in, and, and he and I used to do foot races together because he was uh-huh. a sports person like I was. Now. Uh-huh. And he uh, one time we was we was racing. We was up at Bean Blossom. And we was, after we'd been working some up there, we, me and him and Roland was going to run, uh-huh. see who's the fastest. Right. Well, me and Berline was so much faster that Roland had these little short legs, you know, Roland White. Uh-huh. But he, uh, and we would look back and, and watch Roland, we'd start laughing because we, he'd be trying real hard, but he couldn't run with us, you know. Uh-huh. And we played baseball together and stuff like that. One time my dad was hit, hit a baseball and, and uh, we was catching it and, Pretending was playing baseball, yeah, right. and, and Vic had both hands up like that, and the ball hit him right oh. in the forehead, and, and I almost about knocked him out. Big, oh, Big Jordan, Oops. but he never had played ball in his life, hardly. Uh-huh. Yeah. But uh-huh. we uh, just things like that. You, uh-huh. you th- remember those things when you're, yeah, that you did when you was young, and that had to be so exciting to be out there. It was, and you got to see back when I was with my father, we started when the festival started, when I really went with him. About a year or so later, the Bluegrass Festival started. Right. And then all the, all the other Bluegrass acts started intermixing with each other. Mm-hmm. So we, we'd do shows with Don Reno and Red Smiley and yeah. Ralph and Carter, Stanley Brothers, yeah. Bob and Sons, the Osmond Brothers, yeah. Jimmy Martin. Best of the best. You got to play, you got to play all these festivals, see with those guys. And, yeah. and it was fun. We knew all to each other anyway. Yeah. But we never had done those kind of shows that much together. Like right. back in those t- early times, see, they'd play Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You'd almost do two to three days at one place. Yeah. Uh, nobody charged all that much money back in those days, and mm-hmm. so the promoters could hire you, you know, sometimes. Yeah. But it was fun. It was just a great experience to, to be on those shows. You know? Kind of like a big family. It really, it really was. That's beautiful. Here's another question. Uh, let's see. Do you think that your dad sometimes played something on the mandolin just to challenge the band? Absolutely. That's what he did. He play all beats on beats too, man. To drive you crazy, and uh-huh. uh-huh. he he was a, he was a master at that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. He he uh, he would come up behind you. I mean, like uh, I mean, I learned to hold my beats solid and straight because I knew that he he may be testing me. Right. Bill Monroe was a great, he would test you big time. Uh-huh. Uh huh. He uh, and some players couldn't handle it very good. Mm-hmm. I mean, but and he would he'd line up on them. So he, uh-huh. they started falling apart on, uh-huh. <laughs> on the stage. <laughs> but he, uh, I tell you, here's what. Really, I, I, I learned about my dad too. Uh, if, if if he was a competitive type person, and and you really want to get hot on your banjo or your fiddle, he would really take that to heart, and he'd come at he'd he'd start really going at the melon then. Uh-huh. He uh-huh. he would smoke it then, and, uh-huh. and uh, yeah. I've seen him do that. Uh huh. And seeing the early days when you uh, great players was out there, I mean, uh, uh, Sam Bush came in later on. He was a young guy, but he. He started getting hot on some stuff, and right. and uh, but and my father would see that he didn't, he'd notice that, and he'd, he'd start working on his stuff too. Uh-huh. And he, uh, uh-huh. but he there was no limit to what Bill Monroe really knew. Right, uh, he, he was just a master musician that uh, full of jazz and full of blues when he wanted to put it down. Yeah, I mean, he he could do it. He uh, yeah. he was just he was an awesome player. I was talking to a friend of mine in Florida the other day about his uh, what he could do. It just uh, it'll amaze you. Yeah. Uh, one time we had a show at Bing Boston where we had George Jones. We had the Head Hunters, and uh, I had Leona Williams. I had some other groups. Cal Smith was on, mm-hmm. and we uh, George got on earlier because he had another date he had to go to. Mm-hmm. Well, the girl that, that was supposed to follow him said, "I can't follow him, man." Uh-huh. And my dad was getting ready to go to another show date too. See, uh-huh. and we asked 
they asked Bill, can you would you help us out here? He said, yeah, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. So he followed Jones, uh-huh. and it wasn't he tore the crowd up again like he would if uh, Jones hadn't even been there. I mean, right. just so, I mean, but stuff like that didn't, didn't phase my father. Yeah, we did a show one time in Ohio. We was Merle Haggard, Jerry Lee Lewis, and us. Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. Wow, oh, and uh, th- they had the sound system perfect for. Uh, Jerry Lee and Merle Haggard. Mm-hmm. Well, my father, when it turned, was his turn to come on, he, he said, no, you, he said, I want all the sound people. I said, you get our sound up there to match Haggard's. Yeah. Where we sound, so he, he wouldn't play a note until they got it up there perfect for him. So. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But then he tore the damn crowd up. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just, uh, nothing faced him. See, yeah. I mean, he, he would play with you, man. He, it's just like he worked uh, for the president uh, uh, let's see, when uh, Carter, uh, Reagan, uh-huh. flew my father in, flew Frank Sinatra in. Wow. To, to perform at the White House. Yeah, yeah. Well, Frank wanted to meet my father. Oh, yeah. So he went through Tony Conway, that was my dad's manager, and, mm-hmm. and uh, so he, Tony brought him over and said, Bill, Frank wants to meet you. And uh, Dad said, well, who are you now? And he, <laughs> he said, I'm Frank Sinatra. He said, well, what do you, Daddy said, what do you do? He, <laughs> so Frank said, Frank knew then, right there, my father was playing with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my father said, um, he said, well, I, I sang too. I sang, I sang and I act. But my dad was having fun with that. That's see, he fun. was playing with that. He, yeah, he, yeah. he was just. I said Frank loved it. Oh, he did. He yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he, my daddy was, he wasn't afraid of nothing. Yeah. And, uh, Elvis Presley came up to him and apologized for cutting the song the way that he did, Blue Moon of Kentucky. Right, right. But daddy liked him. He said, he, you know, he was a young ki- kid at the time. But my father had so much experience with things that, that he uh, he knew how to handle things good. He he had a good character about himself. Yeah, absolutely. He wouldn't overplay himself. I, that's something that I was talking about a little bit about uh, yeah. strings on that one song. Yeah. Uh, my father wouldn't overplay. Right. He would play what it had, what it needed. Like Sally Gooden, he would stay right on it. Yeah. And play the break that it's supposed to have in it. Yeah. And then he'd turn it over to the fiddle player or yeah. banjo player, whoever. Yeah. One of the things that, that amazes me constantly, and I've you know been studying, you know, this mandolin playing for since I was probably about, about ten years old, and I just go back to it over and over again, slow stuff down, hear more stuff all the time. Yeah. Is that so often he would play it straight, just perfect, but then sometimes he would really go out there. That's right. But it was always tasteful. That's like, right. Like when I go out there, sometimes I'll fall off the cliff and well, just you like have, you haven't learned yet. You know, but he was just always he always. It's always tasteful, no matter yeah. what he was doing. Well, you got to learn. So you, yeah. you got to work on it. Yeah. You got to practice, 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 practice. Man. Yeah, yeah. All the time. But uh, I hope those things help you that I told you there. Yeah, absolutely. One time when I was a kid, I was in, I was in the backyard on my bicycle. And Daddy was in a, a, a lawn chair out there, had his mantle with him, and he was, had his knife out, and he was cutting on it, cutting on it. And I, I pulled up to him. I said, Daddy, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking, taking their name out. He was taking Gibson's name out. I said, why are you doing that? He said, well, they didn't do what I wanted them to do. He said, he, said, I, he didn't go to explanation to me then. I learned later on. Yeah. He said it to him to have a new fingerboard put on it and new keys. Yeah. They sent it back refinished without doing those other things. He was pissed, in other yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, uh, he took their name out very carefully now. He mm-hmm. left the up there, but took Gibson uh-huh. out. Uh-huh. And he... Uh, he later on had had a guy make a pearl, a pearl inlay that said thing. He was going to put the thing in there. He just never did do it. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> but l- later on, and he kept it out. He didn't talk to him for, I don't know, 40 years or so. But there's when my father, when my father, uh, somebody broke in his house and tore his mantle up. Mm-hmm. Somebody from Gibson, the, the guy that, I can't think of his name. Yeah, now. Darrington, I think. Charlie yeah, Darrington? Yeah, Charlie Darrington. Yeah, yeah. He took great pains in restoring it. Oh, gosh, it's such an amazing job. And he, uh, so my, he said, uh, Bill Gibson wants to apologize to you and talk to you. Mm-hmm. If you'd only let them put the name back in. Uh-huh. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, put, uh, my father said, well, I'll tell him I'll think about it. Uh-huh. And uh, so he, uh, he did, he later on talked to him. And they said, Bill, if you'll do that, we'll give you two mantles a year for the next five years. Wow. Two new F's, F5s. Wow. So my father did that, let him put it back in there. But uh, he waited 40 years before he'd ever speak to him. Uh-huh. Until they got that 
He, he never had no intention of ever speaking to him. It right. just happened to be that Charlie Darrington took care of my dad's mandolin when he got messed up. Yeah. But I was going to finish up on that mandolin. Sonny Osborne and Jimmy Martin was with my dad back in that time. Uh-huh. And uh, I was like 11 years old or so. And, and Sonny said, I heard, we was doing a theater somewhere, and I could hear down the dressing room something screeching going on. Uh-huh. My father had a fine piece of glass taken off that finish. Wow. That Gibson had put on there. A piece of glass, wow. And so that goes with the story that I was telling you about seeing him take the name out. Yeah. But he was just set in his ways of what right is right and what's wrong is wrong to right. him. And that's how he operated. That's how he lived. Yeah. yeah. I heard a pretty funny story, one I hadn't heard before. Uh, somebody was like, maybe he was at the record table of a Bean Blossom and somebody comes up and said, Bill, what kind of mandolin do you play? And he, and he holds it up. He says, it's a V. Can't you see? <laughs> <laughs> it's a V. <laughs> Can't you see? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny uh, how do you feel like your dad's music changed when when you were in the band well it might have changed some because I, I, I my voice was coming along but I, I needed to get he, he was used to stronger singers probably maybe than I was at that time so, lucky get over here come on come on come on, come on. lucky get over here come on and he uh but I, I developed into a better, stronger singer. Oh, gosh, but yeah. I, I didn't come. I didn't come that way. I, I had, mm-hmm. So he was singing a lighter tenor with mm-hmm. me when I first came, when I came. Mm-hmm. And uh, he'd be he was what he didn't hard as he, I know that he could. He, and, yeah, yeah. But I, he was allowing for me. But uh, yeah. later on, then when I developed into a strong lead singer, then he would mash down on that tenor more. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of what I remember. You know? I think that. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely singing strong on Blue Moon Turns to Gold. But he he uh, he he would help you, you know. So many of them. Let's see. Would you be okay with a couple more questions? Sure. Cool. I appreciate you. Thank you. Let's see here. Um. So this is from my mom. Mom has two questions. We touched on it a little bit. I think you might have. Her first question was um. Did your dad mentor you musically when you were growing up? Which is not, no, huh? Yeah. No. And then, uh, like, what was, uh, you know, what relationship did you have with uh, with your dad when you were little? Did you sing songs together? Just like. No, he, uh, he, uh, he would pitch ball with me because he, oh, yeah. you know, he, I want to play baseball. Yeah, he, yeah. I know, he, I, looking back, I, he had to be tired when he came in off the road, but he, he would still say, come on, Jim, we'll pitch the ball. Yeah. Get the, get, go, get the ball in gloves, we'll go pitch them. Uh-huh. He would do that just to have a relationship with me on that. Yeah. But he taught me how to farm. He taught me how to hunt, mm-hmm. skin rabbits. He taught mm-hmm. me how to uh, uh, cut hay alfalfa. We'd cut it three times a year, you know. To, yeah. And you, you shock it. And you, I mean, stack it. Then you call it to the barn loose. and. Uh-huh. I, and I learned how to hitch teams up. He got me, got at me one time for not hitching the team up right. And uh, he, my dad was good for teaching you, but he wouldn't keep going over and over and over teaching you now. Uh-huh. He wouldn't do that. Uh-huh. He, he would think if you don't learn, you're not, you don't you don't care enough to learn. Mm-hmm. So that's, the, uh, he, and he would do that with anybody. Mm-hmm. He helped Ronnie Reno when Ronnie was a young boy on the mountain because mm-hmm. Ronnie was really wanting to learn. Yeah, yeah. And Don had worked for my dad too, you know. So. Right. It made them closer together. Yeah. But he he uh, he taught me so many things. It wasn't just I heard the music because I it was in my household. You know. Right. He would rehearse his boys out there like Clyde Moody and mm. Lester and Earl and wow. you know, Rudy Lyles and Jimmy Martin and mm. uh, Gordon Terry. They all came out to our house. Uh-huh. So I mean, I heard the music all my life. You know. Yeah. And my mother would let us if it wasn't too late. She'd let us step and listen to the opera. Hear him. I, I was looking for here if that guitar make it run for watermelon hanging on the vine. I oh, knew it was yeah, my, dude, dude. I knew it was him then. So, right, right. so we'd get all excited when we hear that run. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We was little kids, you know, and yeah. he would carry. When we was little bitty, he would he, he would let us get on his back, and he'd go through all four on his hands and Aww. knees and carry us around the uh, dining room like he was a horse, you know. Both of y'all yeah, at the same yeah. time. And he and he just uh, do th- stuff like that. Yeah. And they'd be boxing matches come on and something called Gillette back in the early days. And I'd sit down there at my daddy's feet. And he'd say, get on, come on up here and get my lap. And I'd usually go to sleep when I got up there, you know. And mm-hmm. He'd hold me while we listened to the boxing, you know. Oh. And stuff like that. And he uh, he would, after breakfast, every time he was in town now, he would, my mother make the beds up and he'd sit to the end of the bed and play his mandolin. Mm-hmm. He said, you need, to pra- you need to play an hour every day. Mm-hmm. 
your your music. Yeah, yeah. And he did that when he was in town. He, he would practice it. He would practice. I could hear him sing falsetto notes and yeah. and uh, playing his mountain. Hmm. And then he'd do it, do that for about an hour. Then he'd go to the farm, start farming again, and mm-hmm. cutting hay or fencing or whatever. And Working all the time. Then I'd be, I'd go with him, try to hang out with him. You know, but uh-huh. that's why I learned that stuff when I was a little boy. You know. Yeah, yeah. Where do you feel like you want to see the music go? Well, just play it. I, I don't, I don't think it needs to go too far away from the this, the uh, original sound. Yeah. I, I think you need to stay close. You need to have a guideline. Yeah. And, and if you stay, if you learn the basics, then you got something to go with. If you don't, if you don't learn those bases of, of my father, yeah, and uh, not just him, Platt and Scrooge, so, and Don Reno and the rest of them, learn the basics, yeah, the then you got something to build your build your music on. Yeah, but you got to have. It's just like my dad. He see he built his music off of Uncle Penn's old time music, right? Uh, fiddle tunes and gospel singing he learned in Rosie. Mm-hmm. He learned his his uh, his stuff right there, and he uh, learned the tones, mm-hmm. the timing. Mm-hmm. And once you learn that, then you can build off of that. Yeah. Did he ever talk about Schultz, Arnold Schultz? Oh, he did. Yes, sir. He liked him a lot, man. He said that that's where he learned his blues stuff from. Oh, yeah. He 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 said he was wanted to hear him every chance he could hear him. And yeah. He, he got to play with him and Uncle Penn together up there, see a little bit, and, uh-huh. and he had a Taylor Bug Melon. He. He would chop that with them a little bit, and they'd let him play. So I think I read that maybe his first gig, Arnold had hired him to play. Yeah, he, him up or yeah, he, uh, they did, and he he got to. He said Uncle Penn would always give him half of whatever he made. Oh wow! He said if he played like a quilting party or a dance that night, he said if he made five dollars, he'd give him two fifty. Wow! So I mean that's pretty, pretty good, good money for him. It is, yeah. Yeah. But he uh, he's got story. He had stories about those, you know. Yeah. Let's see here. I'd love to got to hear Arnold Schultz play the guitar, man. Wouldn't you? Oh gosh. I'd love to got. To, I'd yeah. love to hear Don Penn play the fiddle. Oh man, mm. yeah. It's kind of like, just like mythical. I know it. In, in the mind, it's like I know. Whoa, it. just just wondering about. It, I know. I remember, it. Like reading the, that your dad said that he had, uh, Arnold Schultz had the prettiest runs on the guitar. Yeah. And just wondering about. Like, well, see here. Kind of when my dad's mother and dad died, he was sixteen at the time, uh-huh. and he. Uh, his, he died, his mother died when he was nine. His daddy died, he was 16 when his father died. So, and his brothers and sisters all left to go north. Mm-hmm. That left my father down there by himself. Yeah, lonesome. And, and terribly lonesome. Yeah. So Uncle Penn took him in there at the last, when, it, when dad was about 16, so he stayed 16, 17, and left there when he was 18. Mm-hmm. But he, he got to spend those years alone with Uncle Penn without all the other, all the other kids bothering Uncle Penn. About, That's a good point. So he, there's where he learned. Yeah. That's where he learned his yeah. his foundation. Yeah. And he never forgot it. And he said that Uncle Ben had like the best sense of time. That's what he said. And like, you know, your dad's sense of time was just... Absolutely. Like, just, that's, that's, and he, he never forgot that time. And man, he kept yeah. it with him. And he, uh, he instilled that in Baker, mm-hmm. uh, Kenny, and, and me. And, yeah. And I've heard him tell, tell other players, you know, he I said, I want the time and play like it's supposed to be on these tunes. Yeah. He said, said, you can't play Sally getting too fast or too slow. It has to be the perfect time for it. Right. Katie Hill, the same way. Yeah. you got to play the perfect time that they're meant, they're written to play on. Yeah. So that's what he did. That's what he tried to instill in us, and I think he did that. Yeah. Much. That's one, one thing I think that some people like myself, like we'll play different songs, but they'll all kind of feel very similarly. Like when I listen to him play, it's like each song just sounds a little bit different. It's got right. its own unique thing. It's That's right. It's magical. Oh, so we talked about Billy Strings. That's good. There's a couple more. Um, Buddy Casey, he was asking about uh, the song, I Want to Go With You. Mm-hmm. On uh, Where did that one come from? <laughs> well... He wrote a song about me and my sister. Okay. I begged you and I want to go with you. We we begged, we, oh. we hated to see him leave. Yeah, yeah. And he so he wrote that song somewhat about us. Mm. And he, uh, I'd cry every time my daddy left. I mean, he'd mm-hmm. only come in on Saturday. See, mm-hmm. I was a little boy, little. I mean, be yeah. three year old kid. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, he would uh, stay with us as long as he could. He had, then he had to go do the opera. He had to go back on the road, you know. Yeah. But we. Uh, it just killed us, cause, you know. We loved our father. You know? Yeah, but we got to uh, spend time with him some, you know. But it's just uh, I used to try to hang. You know, he had a stretched out Chevrolet bus, had a big box thing on top of the canvas over where the bass and everything went. Uh-huh. I would slip in up there sometimes. Oh, 
and, and try to hide. Oh. Because I want to go with them. So. Yeah. And, and then before he left, he wanted to see me. Uh -huh. And that one of his boys would find me up there. So. Uh -huh. And that's, that, that's a story right there nobody knew much about, but that's a true story there. Yeah. Well, I can understand why, why <laughs> you want to go. Yeah. Let's see. All right. I think we got to most of it. Let's more here. Let's see here. We're talking about Bean Blossom. Uh, hmm. Do you have a favorite memory with your dad? Oh, Lord, no, man. I mean, there's so, so many. many. So many. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But he, he just, uh, he was a great person. He, he would, uh, he wouldn't hurt, try to hurt, he wouldn't hurt nobody intensely. Not unless they were real bad people or something, you know. Yeah. He was a he was a caring kind of a person for you. Yeah. He, he and he would understand your plan. And he, he mm -hmm. would tell you where you need some help at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not bad, not bad talking, right, but I mean, just you. try to help you. Yeah. To, to where you need to go with it. Yeah. Do you have any favorite memories of your mom? Oh Lord, yeah, man. I mean, she she was something else. She uh, she she handled his taxes for years, and she booked him. Mm -hmm. Oh. In the early days, yeah, yeah. but my mother had two years of college, so she was oh. way ahead of all everybody else. You know, and, yeah. uh, my dad, those people in Kentucky, had to work early, help their families on the farm. So he he probably got maybe seven grades of education, mm -hmm. maybe. And he uh, so she helped him a lot. Yeah. With uh, certain to say words the right way sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she helped him a lot with the. She was a great partner for him, you know. But she would stand up with him. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, if somebody tries to say something against her, she'd yeah. take up the fight real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> what was your? Uh, so we talked about the first time you played with your dad. What was the last show y'all did together? Oh, let's see. Uh, the last time I seen you play was on my birthday, March fifteenth. He played the Opry mm. before he had his stroke. Mm. He had a bad headache that night, mm. and that's the last time I saw him play. But the last time we played together. Probably might have, might have been being awesome, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm guessing at that maybe. You know? mm -hmm. But we uh, it's just sad to see him go down with that stroke thing, you know. Yeah. Well, what do you feel like your folks were the most proud of you about? Well, I hope they were proud of me. I mean, I, sure I, I I try to do things that I think that they they. The way they would do them. Yeah. See? And uh, I learned a lot from my father about uh, businesses, and uh, mm -hmm. I invested a lot in land and stuff, and, and mm -hmm. they, they did that. And, Smart. Yeah. But he he uh, and I learned how, how to book shows at, from him yeah. originally, you know. But I found myself doing the same things he had done earlier on. You know, I, I found myself getting a big tent. Uh huh. Uh, and I, I, I said to myself, man, you're doing the same thing your father did because he had that big tension when I was yeah. a kid, you know. And uh, But it seemed like it was meant to be. It just fallen into place for me yeah. to do those things. You know? yeah. I, I started my own label because I got tired of messing with other people. I started Rain Tree Records. Hmm. That way I don't have to cater to what people tell me to do with, yeah. uh, when it comes to recording. So I did that early on. And, mm -hmm. and I got my dad on some of my cuts. And he's a... Uh, I got his last 18 or 19 instrumentals in my company. Wow. I've got Blue Moon, I mean, Monroe Blue Music, that's my publishing. Wow. So I've got my dad's instrumentals. Maybe Billy might want to hear some of those. And yeah. So is that unreleased? It's, it's it's something my dad never got cut. He, he hmm. uh, one or two he got cut, but he, he, uh, he just, there at the last, he just didn't get them done. Mm -hmm. he, he just, uh, but there are recordings of those, so he could like hear them. Maybe? Yeah, I've got, I've got that, and uh, Mike Compton cut it. Okay. Mike Compton cut that. Okay, cool. He he did an all this yeah. of my dad's stuff, and he. Uh, yeah. So you could hear that maybe through his stuff too, you know. Yeah. It's just uh, there's some songs that he uh, had written out and never finished, mm -hmm. and I I finished some of those. Yeah. Hmm. I'm always curious about the ones that didn't make make all the albums or. Yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff. Let's see here. All right, one more question here. Here's a song that uh, my father started and didn't finish. I did. I mm -hmm. put the last two verses to it. It's, it's a gospel number. That's so beautiful. Take across the power. Now, that first, first chorus is that is, but the mm -hmm. verses are mine.
That's pretty good, isn't it? That is strong. I like that. Would you be up for playing sing a couple with me? <laughs> I could try to play something with you. I hadn't sung anything in years, man. Oh, I would love that. I want to show you something upstairs here if you don't mind my yeah, dad. Absolutely. I have another song I was going to show you. I find it. Great. Picture her too, if you too. Yeah. Oh, Carolyn. What was her middle name? Minnie. Minnie. Carolyn Minnie. And then who's this over here? That was my sister when she. Oh, that's Melissa. Yeah. Before she passed out. That's a great picture. Beautiful. Here's some here's some handies you might want. To oh yeah. Copy there. Cool. Earl Sunshine Music Bar. <laughs> Chappie, New York. Never heard about that one. The Midnight Rampers. That's nice. a George Jones playing out there. Oh, yeah. Wow. We, did, we played for George's Park out in Texas, and he came to the Bean Boss and played. Oh, that's so that, cool. That's pretty neat. Thank you. He's one of my favorite singers, of oh, course. Yeah. Of course. Look at that. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Love that. That's a good picture. Yeah. A fallen star. That's fancy. He must have strayed from the Milky Way. <laughs> fallen star. Yeah, you're, you're picture of that. Oh, that's a great picture. Looks like springtime. It is, that's right. Back when we cut tall pines. Oh, yeah. That's a great picture. Oh yeah. Cool. Wow. He brought me that cut back in France when he went over there. Oh. Wow. Pretty neat stuff though. Yeah. There's a couple rocks there. Oh, from Jesus too. He brought them back from oh, Israel. from Israel. Wow. That's something in. Very cool. Wow. Love that. Come on upstairs now, Yeah, cool. What about Lucky? <laughs> Triple Crown. Theater. Oh, there's Bean Blossom. That's cool. Like yeah. Right That's cool. Bill and Bill. Present system. Oh wow. Christmas at the White House. Reagan. Is that Mickey Mantle? Wow. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Cool. Yeah. Clinton. Wow. That's oh, that's a great yeah, picture. Like the smiles. Oh, Connie Smith, Fern Gosden, what a voice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh my gosh. Me and him was going to do it, do it together, never got around to do it. Oh, it's been so good. Cash. Haggard. Yeah, Haggard. Love that too. That's beautiful. And there's. Oh, wow. Me and Charlie Dick and George Whittle. Oh, wow. Charlie was married to I I just wanted to meet Charlie. Wow, that's a crew right there. No, I'm telling you. Oh my gosh. I mean, no, tell us. Tell us. Don Anderson. Yeah, big blossom. Oh, wow. Bill Barn, it was up there. Yeah, that's a great painting. That's another painting. That's a good smile there. And here's a James Monroe music hall. Is that still happening up in Kentucky? No, I, they turned it into a bingo thing up around there. So. Okay. That's beautiful. Monroe Bluegrass Country Club. That's a music valley thing I was telling you about there. Okay, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Bass I like them up poachers. Yeah. That's one me and Marty Stewart too. Oh yeah. Love Marty Stewart. Hmm. Wow. There he goes and he played for me. Oh yeah. You never know lonesome till it's chiseled in the stone. Oh, that's a heck of a song, man. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Good picture of me and Jimmy Martin there, man. Oh, wow. Look at that. We're singing together. Oh, 
That's great. I did a show down in Alabama with Jack Green and Stonewall. Oh, yeah. Well, a bunch of great singers there. Got some good memories. Yeah. A little bit of Lynn sitting that picture. Aw, that's so sweet. And Jimmy Dickens. She and Dolly are my two favorite female country singers. So good. I bet Strange likes to see this place too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take that. Next yeah. Time. I bet he'd love to come over and visit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Vassar. That's a great picture there. That's Uncle Birch and me and Pink Birth and my daddy. Oh, wow. Get her in focus. There we go. That was nice. a park we had up in Beaver Dam, Kentucky. Beaver Dam, yeah. That's your grandma. That was my sister when she was younger. Oh, that's excuse me. Yeah. Here's a picture now with me, the Bluegrass Boys in the Midnight Green was on the opera. Okay. Oh, wow. Wayne Lewis and me and my daddy. And oh, yeah. Alan Randy Davis, Alan O'Brien, Butch Robbins. Wow. Kenny, James Bryan. Wow, loaded. Stage loaded with talent. That's great. And there's JB. And JB was your grandfather, he right? Was, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, James there. There's a picture of me, I was about 22. Wow. Yeah. Early on. Yeah, there's Uncle Penn. That's great. Uncle Penn. And some origin stuff I got. Oh, yeah. State of Tennessee, Governor, Proclamation. This is a great key to the city. Franklin. That stuff's kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah. Picture me and Jim and Jesse here. Oh. Oh, that's a great picture. <laughs> I never got to know Jim very well. I would have gotten to visit with Jesse a little bit. He's so awesome. Jesse just fell again, hurt himself. Oh, no. I hate to hear that. I do too. He's gone through a lot in the last few then, years. Then they put a pacemaker in him. Oh, just, oh the, just recently. I think. Oh my goodness, that's a good picture. So that must have been you sitting in there with uh, on the opera. That's cool. And I was doing a, a, a promoting a record. Okay, yeah. Father Son thing. Oh yeah. Every day on the wow. horse. Wow. What's that horse name? Uh, I can't remember. Was that King Wilkie? No. No, a different horse. That's great. Spotted. Oh, there's there's our day of the Big West Boys. Oh, String yeah. Bean, Wilbur, Clyde Moody, Howdy Farsher, my daddy. Wow. That's early 40 stuff right there now. Very cool. <coughs> Boy, and there he is right there. Uncle Dave Mike. I expect him to have black face. Boy, that wouldn't go over today, man. You know? No. That'd no. hang your butt now if you did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guitar there. Yeah. Good picture, Danny. That's a great picture. I've never seen that one. What a profile. That's the old Van Dyke and me and, and uh, David for sale. Oh, yeah. So many good you pictures. Like yes, thank you. Love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you feel like picking a little bit? Yeah, we try. Two or three? Yeah. I love that. Where's your favorite, favorite place to pick? Anywhere in particular? I got that office you want to. Yeah. I got an old D18, it's probably not in tune. I probably gotta get it tuned up. If you wanna play that one, or I don't know if you got your own guitar.
recently. I love it. That goes back to the old times, man. Back in the... Oh, it's the best. Back when Bill Monroe and James Moe was singing that stuff. Man. Yeah. 